Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. We are excited to be sharing this presentation with you about pandemics, privacy, and public policy. Uh, with us today, we are excited to share three of our esteemed colleagues from the School of Public Policy and Administration, Dr. Mark Gordon, Dr. Lynn Wilson, and Dr. Ernesto Escobedo. Dr. Gordon is a graduate of Walden University in Applied Management and Decisions Sciences with an emphasis in nonprofit administration. He served as program director and as dean for the doctoral program in the School of Public Policy and Administration. Dr. Gordon is a core faculty member and primarily serves on dissertation committees. His career spans several national and local nonprofit organizations, including the American Cancer Society, the Arthritis Foundation, the Marin AIDS Project, and the Stop, Stop AIDS Project in San Francisco. His specialties include nonprofit governance and administration, leadership development, organizational development, management, resource development for non-governmental organizations, major gifts development, grant writing, volunteer management, strategic planning, and optimal governance practices. Dr. Lynn Wilson is a PhD contributing faculty in public policy and administration. Her specialization in environmental policy and research interests in the links between environmental decisions and public health are operationalized in her position as founder and executive director of the research and educational NGO Key Trust Institute, through which she is leading a delegation to climate change negotiations in Glasgow, Scotland at COP26 later this month. Dr. Escobedo is a senior contributing faculty. He has published in peer-reviewed journals and presented at professional conferences nationally and internationally. He is a peer reviewer for Walden's Journal of Social Change and the Institute for Business and Finance Research. Dr. Escobedo has 28 years of public service, mostly at the US EEOC and the US Air Force, where he received awards from the President of the United States of America, Federal Executive Association, and Congress. Further, Dr. Escobedo is a pro bono arbitrator at the Better Business Bureau, sits on a large nonprofit board, and is a learner at the Harvard University School of Business. Moderating our panels today will be Dr. Rebecca Stout and Dr. Jim Castleberry, both administrators with the School of Public Policy and Administration. At this point, I'd like to turn our presentation over to Dr. Mark Gordon. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're dialing in from. Um, I just wanna thank Walden for inviting me and my colleagues to share our thoughts today. Um, that's a photo of me um, on my way back from America. I snapped that in Doha on my way back to a mandatory 14-day quarantine here in Bangkok, Thailand, where I currently live. Next slide. So I really have uh, just three basic objectives. One is to promote discussion and to provide a cultural context to our conversation and to pose questions about how do we go forward with a healthier uh, conversation and how can we win the war on the pandemic that I thought we were supposed to be in. Um, when I approached this topic, I used Hofstede's five dimensions of national culture uh, as a way to approach and think about it. Next slide. We're in an American culture war. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 has become a culture war trope. It's joined woke, deep state, critical race theory, stolen elections, the big lie, the January 6th insurrection. They're all artifacts of a larger culture war. Um, there are wide divergent vaccination rates based on political affiliation, and it's fueled by partisan rhetoric. Next slide. Masks, needles, um, and I might add toilet paper into that list, um, are all symbols of the culture war. Um, these are just a few articles that I took off of my phone a few weeks ago um, in doing research for this topic. Um, I get my news from very different sources um, so I don't end up in an echo chamber. Um, but things move fast. Uh, mandates um, are the latest um, in the in the war on the pandemic. Um, Americans are uh, rugged individualists, um, while other countries are literally dying to get the vaccine 
um, Americans are, um, well, let's just say a bit privileged. Um, many nations across the world, including uh, the people I know in Thailand are just, they don't understand what's happening in America. Next slide. We suffer from an epidemic of mistrust. Um, this is a quote from Donald Trump in relation to the uh, Iran uh, nuclear deal with Obama. Um, certainly our mistrust did not begin or end with uh, President Trump. Um, it has deeper roots. In our lifetime, it goes back to Vietnam, September 11th and weapons of mass destruction, uh, and recently culminated in the January 6th riots. Um, but the mistrust of our public institutions, um, just this week, FBI, um, Department of Justice, um, we're reaping the unfortunate ramifications of that mistrust. Um, but the pandemic and the politicizing of the pandemic is certainly not just an American phenomenon. Um, I think it's exposed um, already difficult issues in countries. It's certainly here in Thailand, it's exposed the corruption um, and the utter incompetence of, of many governments around the world to deal with a problem. Um, I can say more about that later if I have a chance. Next slide, please. Misinformation begets fear and fear results in manipulation of people's thoughts and behaviors. Um, so it stands to reason um, why people, politicians primarily, are using um, the pandemic as a way to get their views across. Um, one way to combat that is to become smart consumers of information and news, to be careful about where we're getting our news and to not just get news from our own worldview. Um, next slide. This person who I've never met really touched me. This photo was taken just before she succumbed to the disease. She's a um, prominent, was a prominent TikToker um, and uh, was warning people to get um, vaccinated. Next, uh, please click. We have to balance many issues. We have to balance our public regulation versus absolute personal freedom, which I personally don't believe exists. Um, and we're gonna talk about mandates later with Dr. Escobedo. Um, we have to balance vaccine mandates with authorita authoritarianism. We need to recognize that there's a place for religion, God's will, and, and science. Um, and we have a lot of divisive, unnecessary problems with, um, certainly with the rhetoric and uh, the powers between the federal state and local control. Next slide. So this is in our first rodeo. Um, we've learned a lot from, well, maybe not enough, from how we handled the AIDS um, epidemic. Um, that's me in my 20s in San Francisco. I was part of a volunteer army that would stand outside of nightclubs in lines and to uh, administer surveys and to talk to people about sex. <laughs> um, we were there to give information, accurate information, but we, I think more importantly, were there to listen, to be compassionate and to let people know that we cared and that uh, it was important for them and for us, the community, for them to, um, to be safe always. And perhaps there's a lesson in that for us today. Um, America primarily ignored, certainly at the beginning, politicized, religionized, underfunded, normalized, and generally failed to respond. And the pandemic uh, grew. Um, and these are just a few things that came to mind when I was thinking of, of that time. Next slide. So really things started to change when Mary Fisher um, 
address the Republican National Convention, the Republican National Convention, which I think is interesting and wonderful. Um, and that's when America started to uh, really um, put their budget and fund the, the AIDS work. Next slide. So when we're confronted with unpleasant truths, we'll stand in line all day for the comforting lies. Um, uh, we tend to double down when we're confronted with something that, um, that uh, goes against our worldview or our deeply held beliefs. Um, and frankly, sometimes it takes um, a lifetime to let go of our, our notions that we had before. Um, and I think a lot of people are having to do that now with the um, vaccines and um, letting go of those deeply held beliefs uh, really cuts to the core. And so I understand how difficult it is for people um, to, uh, to hear truth. Next slide. We are experiencing a collective trauma. More than 700 Americans and have died. One in 500 have died. That's a lot of people. That's the entire population of Boston. This has happened to every one of us. Um, um, I was really touched this week um, listening to the doctors talk about their patients and um, just the healthcare industry and Americans are really bad about um, preventative care in general. Um, and the daily Armageddon, the, the dramatization of every piece of news um, isn't helpful and the ratings wars that are happening um, with our news. So I just wanna acknowledge this has happened to all of us and I think we're all gonna have to deal with it uh, in our personal way, but certainly collectively. Next slide. Thank you. So um, these are just a few questions that I pose. How do we promote science with empathy? How do we hold our leaders accountable? How do we reach hard to reach communities? How do we learn from this pandemic for the next one? Because there will be others. And I believe um, each discipline, certainly here at Walden, um, needs to figure out what what was exposed from the uh, as a result of the pandemic. What did we learn, and how can we apply that um, if we need to for the next one? Next slide. The pandemic has exposed and compounded social problems. Vaccine mandates are going to make us miss toilet paper wars. <laughs> Um, we really do need to expect more from our leaders and hold them accountable. Respect science and become better consumers of it. Um, we need to remind ourselves of the importance of kindness and strive for full hearted, compassionate discourse. Um, easier said than done, but uh, the times require it. Thank you for allowing me. Next slide. Thank you for allowing me. Um, to share my thoughts today. Again, this is just to set the stage for our conversation later. Thank you. And I believe uh, Dr. Lynn Wilson is up. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Um, in the stage he set, I think he's uh, set the stage for what I'm going to talk about, which are ethics and equity. In the NGO that I started 17 years ago, we use health as a gauge for evaluating the decisions that lead to the outcomes people want for a preferable future. And so when I head to the global climate meetings in Glasgow later this month, we use health as a lens to consider those choices and the choices we have now and the choices we're making in this global to local public policy sphere that affects every one of us that are touched by the sustainable development goals, which is every single one of us. An enormous part of that discussion surrounds the ethical decision making in all of its messy, chaotic and cultural forms. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
The pandemic is a public policy problem. It affects everyone and it has far reaching effects and it has ethical considerations like saving lives, preventing illness and protecting health and economies. Next slide, please. Equity means social fairness and justice. It's an ethical concept, but it isn't the same as ethics. It's grounded in the principles of distributive justice, where underlying social advantage or disadvantage, think of those boxes under those children on the right as wealth, power, and prestige, the attributes that define how people are grouped in social hierarchies. This pandemic has spotlighted the inequitable from vaccine availability and distribution to an unfair burden on the people who are serving us during emergencies to placing loyalties above the common good. We obviously have a long way to go from embracing what we do today to embracing a culture of equity. Next slide, please. How do we create that culture of equity? We start with ethics. The basic challenge is balancing public and individual interests. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen the imposition of exceptional levels of government mandated vaccination, masking and social distancing to protect public health. And that's been followed by fervent efforts to lessen those constraints in the interest of individual liberty and economic revitalization. As John Stuart Mill said, though, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So using the lens of the director of the Institute of Bioethics, Health Policy and Law at the University of Louisville Medicine, I've applied four tests to my own thinking about these dichotomies and about the ethics. Next slide, please. The first test is necessity and effectiveness. No public health intervention should be introduced without clear evidence of its effectiveness and importantly, its necessity. Pandemics are strongly related to science. So addressing the necessity and effectiveness needs to be based in science. The relationship of policy to science is therefore paramount in making ethical decisions in the public sphere. And that is a place of tension. But like policy, science grows and changes. Never have we seen this more quickly evolve than in the response to the pandemic, where all over the world, people have been pivoting to adapt to the best available science in deciding what is both necessary and effective. The libertarian perspective to this necessity, based on personal responsibility and self-reliance in individual choice, favors individual choice, even with the mistakes, as preferable to governmental intrusion. One thing that seems to distinguish the US is a conservative party that's grown hostile to science and empirical evidence in recent decades. So in looking at effectiveness, equity becomes a bit muddier. For example, if contact tracing using mobile apps is deemed effective and acceptable, what about lower income people who are most at risk for COVID-19 but less likely to have smartphones for contact tracing? Next slide, please. So the test is, is it necessary in order to apply the best available science to curtail certain individual freedoms to ensure public safety in this pandemic? Apparently so, according to the science. Are the requirements effective? Again, scientifically, yes, even if they're not 100% equitable. Next slide, please. The next test is proportionality and minimal infringement. Public health intervention should be proportional to the risk presented. Data privacy first comes to mind, something Dr. Escobedo is going to go into in a little bit more in depth. But when we're thinking about it, overarchingly, things like tracking scenarios, collecting your personal data, sharing that data through a vaccination card. Now, while most of us who travel internationally have gotten used to sharing things with our yellow cards of our malaria, yellow fever, typhoid shots, where we're going to be staying, etc., that's creating a problem from people who are saying this is an intrusion of our privacy here in the US. So to travel sometimes means giving up privacy, but that's expanded to security and ever more since 9-11. Why? Because terrorism, like the pandemic, is a global crisis and it affects everyone. So in reflection, choices about actions rather than actual privacy 
from this ethics standpoint, seem to be the main or at least the most vocal issues regarding the pandemic mandates. Next slide. The test, do decisions at one level affect those at other levels? And if so, what is the ethical public response? Minimal infringement on choice is subject to this test and the test of equity in a global crisis. So when those choices that people make infringe on the choices of others who need care, cannot get a hospital bed or even oxygen, it is in the interest of the public good to set and enforce mandates for vaccinations and other mandated measures to keep people safe. Agonizing choices are being made by our healthcare workers about whom to save, whom to treat, and whom to let die. Next slide, please. The next test is purpose limitations. Some who resist the mandates may be doing so out of concern for what happens when their data is repurposed in social media, geolocation, cell phone records, health chair, check apps, credit card records, and all sorts of other things. Some of these have been valuable in mobilizing needed services and information during the pandemic, so perhaps they shouldn't be prohibited summarily, but neither should they be presumed relevant and ethically acceptable without deep scrutiny. Data can be used for surveillance or law enforcement, and the, those data are likely to be viewed with great suspicion by the public. This is a concern for privacy, which in normal times is more protected. Next, please. There are limits to the use of emergency measures. Are there? And should there be? Let's see how we can use these ethical principles we're talking about. While needed now, after a public health emergency ends, measures permitting this intrusive surveillance should not be content, continued without careful reevaluation. Data from the pandemic perhaps should be minimal. In the US, for example, we may need to consider purging it from our electronic health record systems because those are accessible by law enforcement and other agencies. Just something to consider. Next slide, please. And finally, I examined the test of justice because ethics are about relationship. This is a World Economic Forum site where peer-reviewed uh, uh, materials and data are curated by different universities. For COVID-19, it's Georgetown University. Next slide. Following the link in this particular uh, World Economic Forum site to values related to COVID-19, support the thinking about ethics and justice, and they point to values as a basis for social justice and belief in the necessary institutions that we must have through personal and collective judgments about what is important. Next slide, please. So do the mandates and measures support equity for health and well-being is the test. Because the pandemic is a global crisis, health options span boundaries. Values can help us create purposeful actions aimed at increasing equity and decreasing harm and improving global health, which leads to the question of health as a fundamental human right. Is it? It is, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the U.S. and the U.N. rule of law. Next slide, please. Cartoon break. It was a moment of truth after which they all got back to line. Next slide, please. Ann Zimmerman is an attorney and bioethics scholar from Columbia University, and she wrote what I believe encapsulates my thoughts after musing on these four tests, that by appealing to the framework of the democratic system and systemically re systematically restoring the rights suspended for the pandemic, this must be part of the pillar of that dem democratic system. And really importantly to me, if the common good could never trump rights, then the healthcare crisis could turn the constitution into a suicide pact. Emergencies that do not have borders call for consensus in the action of government. Next slide, please. So in summary, pandemics don't respect borders of space or time and ethics span borders. Appeal to the reasonable with absolute necessity justification, but with also clear rights reset processes after the emergency is over. And using health and well being as a human right can promote equity in decision making and keep us on track where we can use it as a compass. Next slide, please. So, where do we go from here? 
The Australian philosopher and professor of bioethics at Princeton and winner of the 2021 Billiken Prize of a million dollars for his major contributions in advancing ideas says this in his new journal, it is to embrace controversy as a means of getting closer to the truth and reforming social and cultural paradigms. I'm intrigued to see how he'll approach the pandemic. Thank you. Dr. Escobedo, I believe it's for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Gordon. And my name is Dr. Escobedo and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the privacy considerations as you see here. Next slide, please. All right, very good. So on this slide here, I think we also need to add that leaders at all levels, right? need to continue to weigh this balance between health risks and privacy, right? Not just from a legal perspective, but also from a practical perspective. Next slide, please. So these are my themes that I'm gonna talk about in my presentation. And pretty much, as you can see here, they're also meant to start some discussion the first one has to do with the work environment. The second one with all the new technologies that have come about in this pandemic. For us here at Walden, we're probably very familiar with Zoom and Teams, but I tell you in other segments and other industries, Zoom and Teams is new, right? It's something that folks have never done before, maybe have very limited experience. And my third theme there is about vaccination and how we can get that accomplished. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So specifically, as we look at the first question in terms of the work environment, next slide. My background is with the US EEOC. I'm one of the mediators, I've been an investigator and a supervisor with EEOC. And I tell you, one of the things I've seen, as you see in my slide, very recent revision to the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is just huge. Next slide, please. Specifically, if we look at the revisions to the ADA in terms of the work environment is the whole notion of allowing employers to take temperatures of employees, right? And the second, look at this, job candidates as well, after a conditional offer of employment, employers may withdraw the job offer if the new hired employee is diagnosed with COVID-19. You talk about privacy, this certainly hits the privacy button in terms of, from an EEOC perspective, which again is federal law. Next slide, please. Now, let's take a look at the US schools. Next slide, here we are. So we're familiar with the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as FERPA and HIPAA. Now, these govern, right, very strict consent for disclosing personal information about students' health and as you can see here, there are exceptions. Now they've always been there, but now in this pandemic, I think we're bringing those out more. And these exceptions, as you see here, have to do with health or safety, health or safety. Next slide, please. My second theme in my presentation is all the new technologies that we've seen as a result of the pandemic and into the future after the pandemic. Once again, I think here as students, as faculty, we're more familiar with Zoom and Teams, with an online learning, with an online teaching. But again, as I've said, outside of this, I can tell you when I sit with my parties in a mediation, for example, or previously during an investigation, we would have never been able to conduct business like we do today. So let's look at our next slide. What do, we, what do we see now 
in terms of our technology. What are we seeing out there? Of course, we're all familiar with thermal imaging, right? Which is uh, our temperature checks and so forth. But these are not always the best indicators of COVID-19. As we know, for example, there are ways that temperature can be lowered, for example, with many over-the-counter treatments or the other way around where maybe uh, non-infectious conditions such as, for example, pregnancy and so forth, menopause, inflammation, might actually elevate temperature. So once again, we've got some challenges there. Next slide, please. Again, as we look at technology today, we've got artificial intelligence, machine learning. And what catches my attention here on this bullet point is how this artificial intelligence is connected with our analysis of how this impacts public health. C is mobile apps. We're seeing quite a bit of this in our new technology. Again, a year and a half ago, wow, who would have thought we would have had mobile apps tracking public health? And then D, location data. As we see here, this is technology that helps track individuals, perhaps who've had previous proximity to known cases. Next slide, please. So what can be done to satisfy, as I see, as I show here about vaccination, and I'll talk about an extreme case. Next slide. I've masked this country's name, as you see here, I just called it X, but look at this. The use of mobile devices owned by the COVID-19 patients Next slide, please. So what happens here is with those who are confirmed and or suspected patients, there's a text message, right? That is sent to them to go into home quarantine. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide. Okay, I think uh, we need to go back. There, there we are, oh, right there. So some of my closing remarks here, as we look at this from both sides of the equation, right? We look at this once again, for example, from the employment perspective, we have rights and we have responsibilities in the workplace, rights and responsibilities. So a suggestion here, right, is, organizations to review their existing privacy policies. What's in writing? What is in writing? Not only your policies, but also practices. Very, very important. And to continue to review them. The second one is our infrastructure, right? As we move forward through this pandemic and we consider privacy, many, more of us are working remotely, right? So at the beginning, if we recall back to March of 2020, all these questions came about, did we have the correct connection, Wi-Fi in cases of VPN? The third one I think is critical, which has to do with training our employees on the policies we have. A lot of this could be new and it is on privacy right? Especially when folks are, woke, excuse me, working from home. Very important when we're handling confidential, private information, and we're working from home. Next slide, please. We cannot forget, of course, as we know, mental and physical well-being. For me, that is hit. Have you all heard of high intensity interval training? I think it's super critical that we keep mind of our mental and physical well being as we move through this pandemic. And then finally, guidance. 
I put here CDC guidance, but of course there's other guidance out there, including the Department of Labor, Department of Education, as noted, the EEOC and others. Next slide, please. I've got some suggested readings here. I try to go as efficiently as possible so that we could get to your questions and your comments. Back to you, Dr. Stout. Thank you so much, everyone. This was wonderful. And I think really brought up some good questions to be asked. And so we'd like to open it up to the audience to um, type in your questions in the chat box. We have a few questions to go ahead and get us started. Um, so the first question I thought we thought of were, what are your thoughts about mask mandates in schools? Are they violations of freedom? And that's to anyone who'd like to answer. Um, Dr. Stout, if you could stop sharing, we could probably see more photos. Yeah, that's probably yeah, better. Great idea. Cool. Yeah, okay, thank you. Lynn, Ernesto, do you want to? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I, I was adjusting my screen. Okay. What are your thoughts about mask mandates in schools? Are they violations of freedom? Well, I can tell you what's going on here in San Antonio, Texas, where I live. It was a mandate, but effective this coming Monday, October 11th, it's optional. So, I think that's a reflection of where, at least here in this area, right, folks are feeling like it should not be mandated based on that decision to make it optional. Now, it is still up to the parents ultimately because of course they're minors and in, in, in my case, my kids are minors. So I, I think they've done a good job to leaving it up to an optional perspective where up to the parents and, and I also maybe want to add that uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes after Monday. Um, you know, there's an argument on both sides of the coin. The other side might argue, um, well, if we go back to optional masks, we may go back to higher pandemic COVID numbers. The lower numbers is a, is a result of the mandate, right? So that's the opposite side. So I can certainly see both sides. Dr. Stout. Well, I'm gonna I'll weigh in on the opposite side because in my state, it's exactly the opposite. It is mandated and it also reflects our values and our culture. So, and that goes back to that ethical perspective we're talking about. Uh, and and uh, in keeping with what I had to say, it's a public health issue. And if it doesn't make any difference how old you are, if you're spreading the virus. I'm gonna take another, and I don't have children or in school, but I actually think the, the, the all supreme market forces are going to solve this the mandate question for most of us if we want to be employed if we want to walk into a grocery store or a nightclub or a business that has mandated vaccinations that i think that's where we're headed um in fact i have friends in san francisco or in seattle they, they can't go to most places without showing that they've been vaccinated so i think if you want to be in society Okay, yeah. and I'll stop there. <laughs> Lynn, I have a question for Dr. Dr. Wilson, I should say. You can call me. Um, we have a question in the chat from Will Schultz, and it says, um, was directed to you, do you think that states and or feds have indeed, another piece got added in here, so I lost it. Hang on. <laughs> the feds have indeed laid out the restore to normal pathways for policy and suggest that you look at Australia, uh, walk back process. Are there any exemplary cases of walk back thinking and under what conditions? And Will can clarify if there needs to be. Yeah, he can uh, just overarchingly. No, I don't think we've done a good job. <clears throat> I think uh, looking at 
some of the other nations, Germany. Look at look at what Angela Merkel had to say about that. And she was, you know, coming from Eastern Europe, very, uh, you know, pri she didn't want to give up control of the government very much from her own personal background. But by appealing to the rational and using it through science has gotten, it did get a, a, a very different response to saying this is how we need to do it during the emergency and then afterwards what we need to go back to. I don't believe we have a clear that at the state or federal level. And it's one of the reasons, and it's because it's become so politicized, people start in whatever track they're on and it's not about reason anymore, it becomes about politics. And I think that, uh, now, uh, Will, I don't know if I answered your question or not. You did, thanks. I'm, part of what I'm curious about is, is looking at other democracies like Australia, who've taken a very strong intervention sort of approach and to see if they've even laid out any of these sort of walk back policies because sometimes when government gets power it likes to keep it <laughs> it does yeah. and that's what they're no i don't think the australians have done a particularly <clears throat> excuse me lovely job of that either and uh, uh there's a, a lot of discussion about what that's going to mean uh, even later this month when we all get together and talk about it in glasgow is the fact that the, i mean this is the elephant in the room right what do you do when it's over? Uh, it, it, and I think that's exactly right uh, for for ostensibly democratic societies. And that's 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 a very very good question. You know, I would add that the United States of America has this federalist approach to governing, right? Mm -hmm. And and so how is that working <laughs> with the states and the federal government and individual rights? Any of the panelists want to weigh in on that? How do we create better public policy with that model? I can, oh, uh, oh, go ahead, Dr. Gordon. No, I, I was just thinking that um, uh, I don't certainly don't have an answer and we, <laughs> because <laughs> that's a pretty big question, but um, I think that we're in a time where each is testing the limits of their power, the federal government and the pushback from governors and um, certainly local control. Um, it, it's funny how governors are pushing back against federal. And then, for example, in schools, school boards are pushing back against governors and governors are thinking that they're the locus of control and they ought to be. So it's just a, to your point, a mess. But I see that there are, uh, Dr. Gordon, there are, are other issues that we do this on, like terrorism and and weather and mass shootings, and and they can be manageable with the state to state working together uh, in in this in the system. But I go back to the fact of of how COVID and how mandates have been politicized, in and it's such a strong divisive issue in our culture that people are, you know, you're on one side and you just don't cross over to the other side. I mean, Washington and Idaho are fighting over the fact of all the Idahoans that did not get vaccinated and, and were a burden on our health system because they were sending them over to over the border for us to treat. And so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's become just almost a strictly political issue, I think. And again, uh, you know, Dr. Castleberry, that's a very deep question. <laughs> And we just surfaced it here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gary Kelsey has a question. Um, does the panel see any value in having every school or program address and present in a larger community their response to a specific question like mask mandates from each of their discipline perspectives? Talk about embracing controversy, right? Yeah, they should, they should uh, uh, submit to the gentleman's journal I ended my presentation with on controversial issues. <laughs> uh, and I, my first, I tell you, my visceral response to that question is um, we seem to be giving the public microphone to those that can shout the, the, the loudest and be the craziest. So if we did anything like that, we I think it would need to be highly um, managed. <laughs>
Uh, Terry Hartley has a question. Um, should we stop at just the COVID-19 vaccination? Should all vaccines be mandated if we're going to mandate one to interact with society? I think it's, again, it's a pandemic public health issue. <clears throat> Every vaccination is not contagious in the same way. And I think that's that to me is, is a very different line in terms of what we mandate. One is to is to protect the individual and the other is to protect the public. So let, let me follow up on that, if I may, a little bit too, I'm just paraphrasing from one of the other uh, folks contributing, and that is, is there really enough science for folks to feel secure about this new vaccinations? Uh, you know, do we get all the information that we need from the CDC and the center and other people involved in the in the process. Is, is that part of the problem? Do we not really have the data that we should have? Dr. Castleberry, science will never give you the answers. Science is always changing too. And I think looking to science as, as the catch-all and say it's going to give us an answer is, has always historically been a mistake. Uh, it informs the policies we do and it works hand in hand with our social side. Do we have enough information? We never have enough information to make a decision on anything, on climate change, on the pandemic, on anything else. At the same time, we have to make good public policy calls with the best available science, which is the way it's directed towards our decision makers. And with the best available science, we still have to make good ethical judgments. Agree, and I wonder if this new Merck drug will actually change some of our mandates. Maybe it won't be as important to mandate. So if someone gets COVID, they can take a, a post-exposure yeah. drug. I mean, that might the science may change our response. It may. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I may add, uh, from a practical example, I took a trip abroad a week ago. And I think we can learn from other countries and what they're doing at the airports. Uh, it's abroad. And I found it to be quite different from our boarding process here in the United States. I found, I don't know, maybe Dr. Gordon can talk about that as well from his experience abroad, traveling abroad. But a couple of differences that I noticed, guys, and again, this is all COVID-based, COVID-related. Everyone is watching uh, to make sure we're safe while we're traveling. But one change I noticed was the waiting area. We don't seem to have a waiting area before going into board. This other country <laughs> doesn't really matter, right, the name of it or, but the point is that they have, we can learn from other countries. I think we can learn. Also their boarding process was different. So instead of boarding like we do here, for example, any, uh, airline will have its process and so forth. It's a little different there. They boarded actually uh, differently by row. So you couldn't even go to your waiting area. And the same thing when you deplaned, same thing there. And most folks will deplane right from the beginning or the front to the back and so forth. It's a little different here and they controlled it. So again, it, it, the, the, the specifics don't really uh, matter that much, but it's just that we can learn to the question we can learn from other countries. Dr. Anne-Marie Hayes has a question. It's directed primarily to Dr. Wilson, but she would like everyone to weigh in. When schools were shut down, some health officials, especially pediatricians, argued that the risk of abuse and neglect due to isolation outweighed the risk of COVID exposure from being in schools. Where do you stand on this, particularly in the issue of ethics? It's a difficult question. <clears throat> the ethics have to be applied to two different things. One is to the child and the other is to the public. And again, that's back to the individual or the public view. And you have to make a, it, it in the case of some decisions, there has to be a priority to that. As a public health or public policy professional, I think we have to view that the overarching good to the public would have to, to be the, the, the thing that would trump the individual right in that case. It is not a good thing. Neither is it a good thing to have 
children among the people who don't get treated because they can't, you know, there's not enough doctors or not enough people. And it's, it, it's harder when it's children because it pulls on us in a very different way. But it's still, it is, it, it is still an ethical decision in a public context, I think. So that's, that's my view. It isn't that it's okay and it's not cut and dried. And again, this is back to how do we find other remedies when new problems come up? And it's, and none of the, when none of the choices look good. And I think that's a, it's a very difficult question. And I thank you for that question because it is very ethical on all sides. What do you think, Dr. Gordon or Dr. Escovito? I, I, I was just I, I'm taking a diff, slightly different angle on it, the question. Um, I think that I'll let it go. Uh, we don't have time to get into my. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Wilson. There is this sense of cost benefit overall that we have to keep in mind. It's not an easy analysis either way, but I think as long as we keep that in mind, I, I think it'll help us get to the right answer. Dr. Gordon, you did bring up a good point. We are nearing the top of the hour, and so I understand people may have to leave. Uh, but we are willing to continue answering questions if we would like, if people would like to stay, if that's all right with everybody. So if you have to log off, we understand, but we're going to keep going for those of you who'd like to see. There's about, I think about 30 questions to be answered. I don't know that we'll be here for 30 questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to sign yeah. on for that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it's my Friday morning, so I can go until noon. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> there was an interesting question that came from, I believe, a student. Um, does redistributive, redistributive wealth and the commons help with having an ethical view and caring about everyone and add to equity? So I think she's asking about redistributive wealth. And what about it? Because you And the, will it lead to equity? Is I think she's asking your viewpoint uh, of redistributive wealth. Not all by itself. It, it could be a piece of the puzzle, but it takes a, a, a broader um, change of, of, I would say, redistributing values. And that is the depoliticization, depoli I can't even say the word, depoliticizing the, the issues to the point that we begin to look through a different framework, a more ethical framework, one that, that prioritizes well-being. And I think out of that, that fallout from that comes wealth as one of those things that characterizes whether it's equity or not. Again, those three boxes where the little kids were standing on the boxes. It's not the it's not that they all got boxes of different heights. It's that they could see over the fence. And I think it's the same thing here. So I think that is one component. But by itself, no, I don't think it would do it. <clears throat> I just, I'm struck by how foreign this conversation would be to um, people in other countries. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> really. I am too. <laughs> um, one thing that struck me talking about equity, um, there was a doctor on, I guess, CNN, and he was uh, make, giving advice uh, to go talk to your physician. And the person was like, my physician? I don't have a physician. Like, who, what am I going to pick up? So it was just interesting. <laughs> that relates well to a question from Dr. Raj Singh. And it's directed to you, Dr. Gordon. Uh -oh. What should we do or not do to manage COVID-19 as compared to Thailand? Well, it's so different. Uh, the the COVID pandemic here is used as a, as a, a political, well, it's a tool to control and to maintain power and to get wealthy. Um, the King of Thailand set up a company um, to make uh, vaccinations here in Thailand, and denied um, imports of the vaccine and um, was under delivering over budget using public money. Um, when criticized by an opposing, a leader of opposing party, they were threatened with a 30 year jail sentence of criticizing the King. So that's my take on it. 
in believe me it can be interpreted different ways but um uh, it's just different it's uh people will they'll take the vaccine the 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 community trumps the individual um people are dying waiting to get these vaccines so And then there's yeah, people where there's no one left to vaccinate. Yeah. <clears throat> we have a question right. from, from our colleague, uh, Dr. Haynes, who says, considering the proliferation of the Delta variant, isn't it too early to consider walking back from mask mandates or urging vaccines and requiring proof of vaccination? Yes. <laughs> In my view, it is. I, I don't know about it or anybody else here. Yeah, and I, other nations are using technology to do that too. So you right. can hold your your proof on your phone and that sort of thing. And yeah. well, you can even do that on a lot of airlines now too. Yeah, so, and uh, some apps. I think it, one of the topics of um, fake vaccination cards, right? You know, that's a whole nother hour, but mm -hmm. uh, that's something to think about as well. Absolutely. And there's been a big market for those. There were even fake vaccines. A friend of mine in Mexico had that problem. Oh. An expat down there, and they were given fake vaccines, and uh, they came up here to get theirs because they couldn't tell when you went into even the legitimate clinics if the vaccine would be uh, a fake vaccine or not. Yeah. And I encountered something similar, Dr. Wilson, in, in my travels. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more, was south of the border. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, south of the border, with all due respect, um, uh, th there are some real challenges. We have our own here in this country, as we know, but I tell you, um, south of the border really has some real problems with, with uh, things like fraudulent uh, vaccine cards and things like that. I wanted to share with you a quick quote that I read that said, science is not the truth. Science is finding the truth. When science changes its opinion, it didn't lie to you, it learned more. <laughs> science doesn't have an opinion. You, Dr. Mattarelli. And they don't all agree. <laughs> Dr. Mattarelli is on the phone and he's currently living in China. Yes. And he said something about, um, you want to come off the mute and tell tell everyone what you said about masks in the operating room. <laughs> I thought well, that was interesting. Yeah. So so hi everybody. Good morning from uh, Guangzhou, China. So you know, listen, we've been using masks in operating rooms. I I see uh, in the chats a little bit of controversy going back and forth about masks. I encourage you the next time you go for an operation, just tell the staff you don't need it. You wouldn't do that, right? because it's just the opposite of our thinking. You know, operations, we've done operations, you know, anytime you've had those procedures, people put on masks. There's a lot of controversy behind masks. I've been a registered nurse for 30 or oh, more than 36 years. Step back from the mask and look at how a virus, respiratory viruses are transmitted by contact with your mouth, your nose, your eyes. So think of the mask as a barrier, good, bad, or indifferent, good mask, bad mask. If it stops you from doing this, you have placed a barrier between yourself and a virus, any virus, the flu virus, uh, intestinal viruses. So, so I would encourage people to just kind of rethink this whole mask concept, right? And um, you're right, a, a good mask worn improperly it has got a fault to it. Uh, a bad mask worn consistently um, actually has, has value to it because it's keeping your hands away from your face. Um, so I live in China. We, um, there is no argument with the government. Uh, we do what we do, but, but we have freedom. Uh, I go to malls, I go eat, I go to work, I walk outside. Um, uh, but you give up measures of freedom to do that. As people have described, I have a, an app on my phone that follows me anywhere and everywhere I go as part of their tracking program. Thank you.
Very good point. You know, if I may add to that, as you mentioned about the app, have, have, do you all have digital clothing? Digital clothing? You all familiar with that? Yeah, it it um, it's here a little bit. I mean, you see it more. I experience it more in the international setting than in marketing. Like if you picked up an R, uh, a piece of clothing that's got an RFID tag in it, suddenly that company's marketing shows up in your social media. Uh, so this, the technology is certainly out there uh, to be watching. One of the things I heard about today on this digital clothing is that just like we are here, uh, we can buy an app where they will put clothing on us, right? So for example, if we were in a, in a suit or you know, wear a Rolex watch, so you can buy an app, right? That will actually fit you with clothing that you're not even wearing, right? And this is uh, the digital clothing. So as you were talking about, I think out of this also, there's been some capitalism that's come out. <laughs> and a perfect example there, right? Where folks have said, look, uh, would it be a benefit if we had digital clothing? So for example, uh, I wanna show that I'm wearing a Rolex, I'm not. You know, digital clothing will put clothes on me that I'm not wearing. So it's interesting how there's been a flip side to all this where there's been capitalism as well uh, come out of it. To your point, uh, Dr. Mattarelli. And that relates well to a question from Tobias Ball who asked Mark, Dr. Gordon, you mentioned earlier that you do not think absolute freedom exists. Can you explain? Well, <clears throat> I made a comment <clears throat> in preparation of this that um, we're regulated even before we're born while we're in the womb. I just think that we're born into society and as such, um, their society imposes things on us. So that's a very basic fundamental. I don't believe in um, that absolute. Um, now, if we want to go live in the woods, perhaps. That's the short answer to bias. <laughs> well, that's another question that's related. And I think this is another hot topic that could go on for hours if we so desired. Um, someone is asking, Barb Anderson is asking about immigration. So if we are doing our hardest to control and minimize the spread on our end, how do we do the same with immigrants who might be coming in who are unchecked? Who wants to tackle immigration? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I don't want to talk about American immigration, but uh, Thailand went through a period of blaming um, Burmese, uh, Myanmar immigrants. So it's not just an American thing. <laughs> It's easy to other otherize the pandemic. It's a global phenomenon. So it really, mm. I agree with you, absolutely. And and cultures from the very beginning of time have, have demonized the other. So I think that's absolutely accurate. I would agree with you, Dr. Gordon. Uh, I, I think that we tend again, I'm gonna go back to the, I feel like I'm beating the same drum, but rather than looking at it from a rational standpoint, we tend to take an emotional response. And I think if we would look at it in its historical context and rationally, that if it's a global pandemic and people all over the world have it, we're spreading it, that then we have to take the global perspective. But Lynn, I really liked your comments about um, when we can declare we're the winners. Mm -hmm. How do we walk back some of these things? Because I huh. don't, uh, I did the quarantine, uh, Stephen, and I had, you know, the the tracker on my personal phone. In the moment it was over, I deleted that sucker <laughs> for me. <laughs> so I like, we got to keep that in mind. And, and we're going to have right, to go to the UN power. later this month. I mean, we get tested every single day. We can't get into the venue without our daily test. They will be tracking us, they know where we are. We have to have the app on our phones. Uh, you know, uh, but if you're going to put 194 nations, 197 parties together, I don't know what else you're going to do. How in the world are you going to do contact tracing? If somebody, and there will be people, even though the UK government provided all the delegates who are in the negotiating space with vaccines, who would take them? You still got people with religious exemptions and other things. So um, yeah, you're, we we will be completely tracked. And then does that data go away? Of course not. 
And by the way, for everybody who goes on vacations in the UK, you, you must realize you're on some of the best CCTV on the globe. <laughs> Yes, we are. <laughs> so everybody who's enjoying freedom in London and going to the theater, I can assure you, they know the amount of pores on the, your face. Thank so you people so have to understand that what they think is freedom in quite a liberal country, I lived there for about 20 months, um, is for the national perspective, uh, that there are things that are not entirely free. I think this is a good question, just because it'll be an easy answer, but I think it's one that maybe has some misunderstanding for you, Dr. Escobedo. What is the difference between a mandate and a law? And that comes from Dr. David Milan. Wow, great question. Well, um, a mandate is required, right? It's required. From there, uh, I would suggest that uh, there, there is some level of um, decision by the person. And um, as I mentioned earlier about mandates in our schools here, in, at least in San Antonio, Texas, it's no longer a mandate no longer required as of this coming Monday, October 11th. It's optional. So I think that would be uh, both, both, both examples, right? One where it's required, it's by law, you must, you can't come in here unless you have this or you have that. And the other is, is really more of an option. Good question. I think I got through all my questions. Dr. Castleberry, do you have any others you'd like to share? No, I, I don't. And, you know, I, I am so impressed with the panel and with the questions and the dialogue and the comments in the chat. It's been amazing. So um, thank you so much for being a part of this. This has just been great. Look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much, everyone who is attending. Thank and thank you to our panelists for giving up your early morning and late evenings to be with us today. So thank you so much. Thank this you. was a pleasure. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, Bye. for hanging in here. Thank you all.